Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Woody Allen Adjacent. It's a podcast series where we talk about all films in cinema that we've handpicked and we talk through through the lens of being Woody Allen fans. Woody Allen fans specifically. I'm here once again with my co-host on his venture, James Daniel Walsh, sir. Thank you for being on as always. Always a pleasure. Guys, thanks for listening. As you can tell, well, if you don't already know, this is part of the Woody Allen Retrospective podcast feed. We've spoken about every single Woody Allen movie. We've got over 50 discussions, but I've really been enjoying this new venture, talking about films that have some spirits or some... Well, we, we break down things we like about these films and compare to Woody Allen. Last time, we actually spoke about 2000s, Keeping the Faith with Edward Norton and Ben Stella. It was so fun talking about that movie because the first time I watched it, I had a different take on it. The second time, I saw it a different way. And James had a lot to say about the movie. You had a you had a history with the movie, which I appreciated you bringing up again. And yeah, it was a great discussion. I'm, I'm glad you recommended that. And I thought that was a, a fine addition to our little project here. No, that, that one was, it was nice because I, the, I think the two movies before it i hadn't really enjoyed so it was <laughs> it was nice to talk about one uh, that i liked well that's the thing we can't we talk about what we enjoy we're critiques yeah. or amateur mm-hmm. critiques so we're just <laughs> gonna put films in our in our laps and discuss them and this one is very special because this is one of my all-time favorite movies and it's a movie that for reasons we'll get into now never really saw the light of day we're talking about a movie that was released in 1999 called Enthropy. And a lot of people say 1999 was one of the greatest times in film Western Hollywood history for movies. I don't know if you agree with that, James. I do. I actually, uh, I own a book uh, that uh, that discusses that very subject. And I remember very well uh, 1999 and going to see Fight Club and being John Malkovich and Magnolia. And- nice. Uh, the Matrix, bang, 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 bang. The Matrix. <laughs> uh, yeah, there was 1999. Was a, a it, it was it was a it felt like the culmination of like the the 90s indie scene. Yes. Uh, right before, and, and then you know, 1999 was also Phantom Menace, which sort of kind of brought back the big giant blockbuster thing and kind of yeah. engulfed the indie scene. And we might have a film here that. It's seen as an indie hit in some ways, and in other ways, it's a film that is kind of hated. And I have so much to say about my history with this movie because, as I said, I love this movie. The movie is called Entropy. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Entropy, entropy, and the definition of the movie. I think the definition of the word entropy is basically chaos. In space, you know, the stars, the galaxies, things colliding, the complete randomness and chaoticness of space elements that's entropy it's natural it's chaotic it's life i think it's an interesting title for the movie it was directed by phil john joanu i might be pronouncing that wrong and uh, if you don't mind james would you mind giving us a brief synopsis of the movie and then we'll start to discuss our dealings with this movie sure uh entropy uh is the story of jake played by stephen dwarf a, uh, a music video director who is making his feature film debut uh, and falls in love at first sight with a model named Stella and all the uh, the chaos that ensues from trying to, to keep his artistic integrity uh, at the same time as sort of being in this whirlwind romance. Perfect. Perfect. This time, I know in our other discussions, I've played audio clips. I found it hard to clip out parts of this movie I want to highlight because I, in a way, I still don't want to spoil it. Like, I, I want to talk about this movie without spoiling it, but it's a hard movie to actually get because officially it was never released on DVD. You can find it on DVD, but it really wasn't. And that's got to do with some chaos with actually the distribution of this movie. It never got a theatrical release in the US, even though it's an American movie. And I want to say, I love the movie, so I'm biased. Now, over the years, let's, you can love a movie and you can have a hard time being critical on the movie. 
And because I love this movie, the first time I watched this movie was, I think it was the year 2000, I saw it on a cable company in the UK called Sky Television. And it was just on, and it really blew me away. And the thing that really drew me to it was, I had just started watching Woody Allen films, and I think not 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 too far between seeing this movie i saw annie hall and it really struck a chord with me that relationship between woody allen and diane keaton it was intimate it was fun it was natural i felt the chemistry and i started my woody allen journey you know pretty early on around 2000 and then i saw this movie and i felt the same way i felt the character connection the romance the life story as well as the editing, the way it was executed on the whole, it really, this movie made me fall in love with cinema because I loved the story. I loved the characters and it really got me on an emotional level. I don't know why, but what I will say is that I would go on, I would have dates with girlfriends. I would show them the movie. They would hate it. Stephen Dorff in particular, people know him most from Blade. The first Blade movie, Wesley Snipes, he played the villain Deacon Frost, that kind of modern vampire. He was an idiot. And he was it was really corny. And every time I would show someone this movie and they would see this guy, they'll be like, that guy? This guy? That was one of the reasons I couldn't really get people into this movie. They just hated Stephen Dorff in Blade and they just didn't really want to give him a chance. But I've watched this movie cont- like every other year and I watched it just two days ago before doing this discussion and I still love the movie and I'll get into all the nitty gritty but I just want you guys to understand where I'm coming from I feel a little bit biased but I still think even now being very critical of myself I feel it's a good movie but before I gush anymore I want to hear the fresh opinion <laughs> from <laughs> James Walsh you've never heard of this movie I just want to hear your raw opinion your honest opinion what do you think of Infopy? And just just go for it. This is your time to shine. This movie should have been called uh, 1990s The Movie. <laughs> until the very end, I won't get into spoilers, but until the very end of the movie, I didn't see the Woody Allen connection. It felt more like a post-pulp fiction uh, Quentin Tarantino kind of a, a movie with the, the, the you know, there was that, that, period of time after Pulp Fiction where there'd be movies like Go they all had that that shot of like traffic sped up really yeah. fast and 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 you know the the music that played and the the cuts and everything which I always found weird that you know that Tarantino was any kind of an inspiration for that because his movies aren't like that hmm. but um, you know going into it not knowing anything about it I I will give the movie this. I thought I knew where it was going. Hmm. I assumed, you know, the the whole plot about the producers of the movie, uh, you know, it's the one guy who almost looked, he, he always plays like a mafia character in movies. And, uh, you know, he's screaming, you're dead, you're dead. <laughs> and I kept thinking, okay, they're going to kidnap the girlfriend and you know it's gonna be this this story about like these these uh rogue producers who are trying to get the director to do what they want by holding the girlfriend hostage and that it was gonna go in in that direction and then it didn't which i give it credit for like not going the the cliche route that i thought it would but instead i found it kind of meandering Hmm. and the the Stephen Dwarf character and I you know yes everybody knows him from Blade I know him from The Gate when he was like ten years old wow uh, this horror movie from the the eighties deep cut and what did you say yeah oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, and yeah it's not that I had a problem with him I, I don't have a problem with him as an actor but he just it, it 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 his performance to me felt very much like he was on stage it felt like i was watching you know a, 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 a you know a play that was happening in a basement somewhere in hollywood and um 
I had a very hard time getting into his performance and the, you know, I mean, you, you sent me this, what, what may be the only interview for this movie that exists because I went in and I, I looked for stuff. I looked for reviews. I looked for, you can't find anything about this movie. Yeah. Uh, it, it barely exists. And so, you know, I, this is maybe the most cold that I've ever gone into a movie before. <laughs> no trailer, no nothing, nothing, no preamble, just movie, straight movie. Yeah. And in the, in that way, it was it was interesting because I didn't know where it was going, but I I just didn't particularly like the characters. I I found them very shallow. And and I it didn't end up even particularly resolving in a way that I could could understand. Like I, you never really find out what happens to his movie. It 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 ends pretty much the exact same way that Annie Hall does. When it when it got to the end of the movie, I was like, okay, there's our Woody Allen connection. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, but. Uh, it, and I guess it's based very much on sort of real events that happened to the director, but um, which I didn't know, by the way, which I didn't know. But mm -hmm. yeah, going, yeah, I, I don't know. I just had a it. It, I, I, you know, I, I got you don't you don't have to mind for compliments. <laughs> you hated it. You no. hate it. <laughs> you I, wouldn't well, be the first person to know that. <laughs> I didn't like. In the first half was very difficult for me to get through. Mm. Uh, the second half, once I realized it wasn't going to go the crime film route, and I could sort of, I wasn't waiting for something to happen. I was like, okay, this is the movie. This is what we're we're getting out of it. Uh, I enjoyed the second half of it more, but uh, yeah, that that. It, it, like I said, I just found it kind of meandering and it didn't really do much for me uh, as far as, you know, I no, I had no sympathy for the characters. I didn't find the romance charming. I thought it was just very, like I said, it was very 90s. Yeah. It was every 90s cliche you could possibly have was in it. What did you think of the, I know, again, so many people have hopped on this movie because of Stephen Dorff. They think He's just wooden. They pretty much what you you said. I've heard people say in the past. Let's talk about the female actress playing Stella, Judith Godrenchi. Am I saying that right, Judith Godrenchi? Yeah. What did you think of her as actress? Do you think she sold her part? Yes and no. I didn't understand at all why she was interested in him. It it felt like I, I'm imagining the the writer director sitting down to make this movie and him very much romanticizing whatever it was that actually happened to him because she's a runway model and he's there and she winks at him and you know nobody believes that that actually happened but then later on they see each other and i just thought why <laughs> why him what what made him special at all that you noticed him I actually found the the character that Kelly McDonald played later on in the movie to be a, a lot more interesting. <laughs> than That's her, that is fucking hilarious because she's only in it for like ten minutes. 10 yeah, minutes movie screen time. <laughs> and I, but she felt like you know it was basically the same thing. It was like rushing into a romance really fast. Yeah, but her character felt like a more genuine, natural person than Stella did. Stella mm. to me just felt like like a a kind of a cliche. She oh it's this model and this guy is you know instantly attracted to her and somehow she's instantly attracted to him and I think they're saying they love each other by the end of the first night. Well I will say this and this is one thing I really love about the movie. He is a bit hesitant about the their relationship for a while because she comes on strong about I know, because he's like, well, I don't get this. Like, why? How are you so sure? He's asking a question about why. Because it feels like people always say there's these movies where male characters have this pixie manic dream girl that's just a dream girl that falls out of the sky and is the perfect woman and it's bad writing for the female. So 
whenever I watched this movie in the past, I thought this was another one in the movies. I always thought, yeah, what is it with these girls that just seem to come around in movies? But the thing is, growing up, I've had a few of my friends that have had girlfriends like this that mm -hmm. are just really nice and they get on well and they met online and they just struck up the match and the fire of their relationship burned. It just, and you know, I watch this movie and I'm just like, what I appreciate about Stephen Dorff's character is that I think he was very hesitant to fall and he just got engulfed in his feelings. But then stuff happens in their relationship, especially one thing in particular, very big. And I felt like he's having a reasonable reaction to something. And actually, I will just say it. They get, there's a pregnancy in the movie where he's very, I wouldn't call it detached. He's just shocked and a little bit like, this is really fast. And, you know, we've both got our careers or I don't, we've only known each other for so long. This, what's the rush? But she, again, is just swept up in this love at first sight thing. But I like the way they handled that because I felt like they were having an honest conversation when this was mm. happening. Like they went to dinner, they spoke about it. I think in a lesser movie, it would have just rushed through it. Like even when we spoke about liberal arts, it, it, things happen quite fast there. Even though they did try to talk about it there as well. Every time I watch this movie, I still think it has a maturity to it that I really appreciate. And I will admit this this love at first sight concept is a big conceit of this movie and by the end of the movie you wonder were they really in love and what is being in love and was this just a really intense infatuation but mm. i was kind of smitten by their relationship in general but um i just i think people hate Stephen Dorff a lot of <laughs> regarding yeah, this movie, yeah but, and that's the yeah. i don't hate even like in blade i mean i i know that people have a problem with him in blade i never did I think if this would had been a movie that, like you, I saw when I was younger, yeah, I might have more, like because I had those relationships when I was younger, the, you know, really intense, really uh, all-consuming relationships, and and now I I'm you know I'm watching the movie and I'm like stop calling him while he's trying to work. <laughs> <laughs> cynical bastard <laughs> yeah it, and that's but that's how i'm I'm just thinking like he's on he's working right now can it not wait <laughs> why do you have to be bothering him right now and it i i looked at it more as somebody who I, and you know i i don't know how old they're supposed to be i know steven dwarf would have been probably in his probably in his early to mid 20s yeah correct around that time so you know, if he had been much old, if he had been sort of 40, that would have, I would have been like, you're a fucking idiot. <laughs> yeah. But being younger, I could sort of, I could go, okay, you know, they're swept up in this thing. I remember feeling that and everything, but I, I don't know. Like you said, just coming at it now older and not having any sort of nostalgia for it. It, I'm just watching people making stupid decisions mm. and uh, and thinking to myself, why are you doing this? You know. Well, let me ask you some more questions because I want your opinions on this, the aesthetics. Now, this movie has an as a way of narrating and executing and editing. What did you think of that? Very nineties, but I still think mm -hmm. some of the things he was doing was pretty cool at the time. That wasn't being as Woody Allen's definitely used some of this inspiration. Right. But what did you think of that? Um, it, I mean, it was, it was different than say Annie Hall or a movie that, that, uh, does talking to the camera and narration really well is high fidelity, but high fidelity. It's just sort of John Cusack stopping in the middle of everything and turning to the camera and addressing the audience. But he's normally alone when he's doing it. It's not stopping like, a, you know, the movie, the characters don't freeze around him and everything. And this was interesting in that sort of he just a scene will stop and he'll step into it from this one moment. He's always in his boxer shorts and a T-shirt and, uh, you know, telling the audience this is what's happening. And that was different than than things I I can't think of any other movie that did it quite like that. Did it help? Do you think it worked? I, th I think you didn't 
necessarily need it. Like I wouldn't have been lost if the narration hadn't been there. And I do think that like acting wise, those were the moments where it felt like watching somebody, you know, in a, in a low rent play, mm. the way that he was delivering the lines. But uh, it was visually interesting to, mm. you know, especially there's one where uh, one part where he's, he's in uh you know, he's getting up out of bed. And so you still see him on one side of the screen while he's coming in from the other side of the screen to narrate, which I thought was, uh, was done really well. Again, I don't know that it, it necessarily worked as well as something definitely. I mean, obviously like it didn't work as well as Annie Hall. And uh, I would say it didn't work as well as high fidelity, but it, it and you're right you're right it's like a very 90s kind of a kind of a thing to do in your movie but um i mean this whole thing reminded me a lot of because th this would have been the time where i was just starting to try and get into the film business myself and this reminded me of like everybody's low budget film hmm. that they were trying to make at that time everybody was trying to do this kind of a movie but again, that's why I think I I, I leapt to the conclusion that it, there would be some sort of crime element to it because everybody also had to put that in at the time. But this being just sort of a straightforward romance, I don't know that you necessarily needed the narration, but it didn't detract from the movie either. Hmm. So, score. Um, obviously, you two are in the movie and the reason why they're in the movie is because in real life, they know the director. Uh, we'll talk, I want to have a big talk about the real life happenings of this movie and how it came to be. But you two are in the movie as well, a bit self-referential. They do some of the soundtrack as well, as well as the score. What did you think? Did you think, very nice. I know you were already going to say that anyway. Mm. <laughs> but do you think it lent well to the emotional scenes? Did you feel the music, the score? What did you think? Well, I like you too. So, uh, it wasn't uh <laughs> if it had been a different band i might have been irritated by it but the music worked in you know it didn't have like the like they were picking just 90 songs out of out of uh the the indie scene the fact that actually this was the biggest band in the world at the time mm -hmm. that was a major get for them very big um, get. but um you know, there's the there's the part where Bono comes on the TV and is kind of talk that 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 part did confuse me where he's he's talking to him on the TV while Stephen Dorff is dead drunk and trying to <laughs> convince him to like slow down and stop and everything. And then Stephen Dorff gets up to leave and he tries to open the door and the, he's like, you know, Irish bastard locked me at locked me in. And I'm like, how did how did he get locked in <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, surreal it's a very surreal scene yeah uh but you know and th those were the moments that maybe bothered me a little bit where it, it was sort of like you know there's a, a scene where he's talking to a cat and the cat is or the cat is talking to him and i was sort of like what is happening right now is this <laughs> actually happening or is this in his is he drunk uh what is what's going on right now yeah that stuff didn't <laughs> work for me as much but having bono in it they they did a good job and i i think it was it felt like a i mean obviously this is based on the director's life and and the director did work with them but it also felt like a case of um you know sometimes you'll have access to something and you build your movie around that you know, yeah. like, oh, we've, you know, we've got all these monster masks. We're going to make a monster movie and we're going to write it around the fact that we have these costumes and masks. Uh, it felt like, oh, I have access to you too. So I'm going to write things around that and, and bring them into it in a way that felt somewhat natural, but I was always very confused at like, uh what bono's role actually was as his friend yeah 
And I'm going to, I think what we need to do now is basically move to the element where I'm the most surprised. And for all my love of watching this movie for years, just thinking it was a straightforward love story, something, I, I, there was something about this story, just like you, you were surprised it didn't turn into a 90s Tarantino-esque crime thriller at the end or something. And I felt that way. There was something about this movie that was I felt was off. So I found, even, again, being a fan of this movie for so long, I never found an interview. I never understood the director and why its conception or where it came from. Turns out that this was basically based off the director's life. The director, Phil Jonanu, has been a long-time worker in Hollywood. And this movie is him basically getting stuff off his chest. And especially this relationship between him the main character jake and judith godrenche or stella seems to be a relationship he had and in the interview which i will link in the description down below it was done in 20 i think it was 2016 after he did another movie people just asked him about his filmography and entropy was a movie he never got released that he basically poured his heart out and apparently if you read the interview it was actually steven spielberg <laughs> that convinced him to pull it all out there like a Woody Allen movie. I think he said that verbatim, like, you know, do something like Woody Allen and just put it all out there. So he was, I mean, he was directly inspired to do something like Woody Allen and put it out there. So, I mean, this is another movie that was clearly adjacent to Woody Allen because he was directed to do that and there was catharsis for him to do that. And in the interview, he goes into detail about that. And now watching the movie, realizing that it's basically a true story and he just getting this relationship and his movie career and most of the big parts of this movie actually happened it kind of makes more sense like yeah in the 90s I, I, when i showed people this movie in the 90s they were just like what this isn't like any other movie the romance is it's not cheesy enough to be a like a a chick flick but then it's kind of kinetic and has that dynamic editing and energy of a tarantino film but it's still a romance at heart i mean I didn't get it. My friends didn't get it, but I loved it. And knowing it's a true story does make it make sense to me, especially that it's about the director. In terms of him talking about the film industry, obviously there's a there's a whole. I think it's a bit of a cliche. Film directors they just want to they just want to make good movies, and the producers and the studio get in the way. That's a big part of the film. Comical. A lot, a lot of the comedy comes out of that. Seeing it now. It's kind of played out even i know that in 2020 you've seen woody's done it even in his own filmography mm -hmm. a few times as well hollywood ending it's just one film that comes to mind where he did that a, 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 quite a lot as well yeah uh the, it was i found the interview illuminating but i think what i want to ask you james is the reason why this film never came out is because i think the people that he was in dealings with were getting the, the distribution out just screwed him they signed a bad contract. It never got a proper DVD release or theatrical release. I want to ask you, James, if this movie actually came out when it was made, do you think it would have made any kind of splash or do you think it, it had a place in history as a good romance or a good film? What do you think? You know, it's, it's tough to say. If this had come out in 1996, I would have said yes. Hmm. Um, by 1999, movies like this were becoming fewer and far between. Even, you know, everybody says, and, and they're right, 99 was a great year for movies. And even though a lot of those movies were independent movies, you know, if you look at like Magnolia, it's got Tom Cruise in it. You know, if you look at uh, being John Malkovich, it's got John Cusack and Cameron Diaz. And, you know, it was sort of like the... There was this sort of controversy at the time in the 90s of like the studios taking over the independent movie. You know, Miramax would come out with the English patient and they'd say, oh, we've got this little independent movie that cost $40 million and, you know, has these Hollywood stars in it. This felt more like a, like a 1996 Swingers, Chasing Amy. Yes. Kind of a movie. And yes. 100 percent it it fits into that that vein and so it could have had a life you know as one of those kind of kevin smith 
uh, 90s movies like Clerks or something. I 100. That's a great. I just have to commend you. That's that's actually a great take that I didn't even think of. I agree. But by 99, would it have made a splash? I think it probably would have come and gone. Mm. I think it, it would have maybe made some sort of a splash in art house theaters. But yeah. um, I, I don't think it ever would have gotten a wide release. Probably not. And I think there was a lot of movies being released on DVD in the you know late 90s, early 2000s, because that's when DVDs were really popping off. I think it's could have had a really good life on DVD. And now you can only find it like on bootleg DVD, on Amazon, and some of the prices are ridiculous for this movie. Um, when you read the interview, he did say that he actually optioned a cut of this movie to Netflix and Amazon, but they had some kind of cut where which had different shots, which the director wasn't happy about. So apparently he had them taken down. So mm. you can't stream this movie either. <laughs> it, is on, it is on YouTube. I, I was able to find the whole movie on YouTube. It was on actually in parts, yes. It, yeah. it, someone uploads it in parts on YouTube, which is still not a great way to watch it. But, you know, that's one way to check it out. And um, the funny, another funny thing is I'm going to kind of wrap this up because I've said all I want to say. I made a YouTube review talking about how much I gush over this movie. But even I know this movie got me young. This movie doesn't age well just because it's one of those movies that are, there are better versions of it. But mm -hmm. a lot of things still make it unique and for me i want to use the word fresh but genuine i think there's genuine chemistry and intimacy between the two characters and i think it's mature i love maturity in relationships and i think these two characters the way their relationship develops and the way it sways left to right and the way it ends i think it's a mature ending a realistic story and it happened to the guy as well obviously he wanted to get off his chest and it's always it always had a soft spot in my heart because of that. But it's a movie that has fallen through the cracks. <laughs> yeah. Fallen through the cracks. And Stephen Dorff as an actor, I mean, he he was picked for um True Detective season three with Mahasha Ali, which I haven't even watched. And I heard that was fantastic. I heard mm -hmm. that he people do appreciate him as an actor, no matter forget about Blade. I want it to look at that. And he he work, he's working with the new Blade. Marsha Ali, that's a new blade. So mm -hmm. how's that for um three uh two uh, steps of separation? But yeah, man, um I really like the movie. I wish people would check it out more, but the problem is you can't get it on DVD really. It was never really released, and I don't know what to say. Every time I've recommended to someone or shown to someone, they can't seem to get past Stephen Dorf. <laughs> <laughs> but I still think it's a, I still it's one of my favorite movies. Still, I still enjoy it, and I I really wanted you to check it out, uh, uh, James, because I think it has something to offer out there. But if nothing else, man, like you said, nineties night, this movie screams nineties yeah. in a really funny way, in a cheesy way. But I think it's a great sh snapshot of the nineties, if nothing else. It, and, you know, as far as Stephen Dwarf goes, uh, you got to give him credit in that he probably could have had a career doing bigger movies. And, uh, you know, he stuck to these these indie movies. Uh, Blade, I think, might have been the... I, that I can think of as the only big movie he ever did. Do you know he did a superhero movie called, not American Ultra, American something, where he had superpowers? I can't remember. And I was like... I was thinking to myself, and I like Stephen Dorff, but I was thinking to myself, someone keeps on giving this guy a chance. When I saw him being cast in True Detective Season 3, I said, wow, that is a big chance on HBO to hire him. And I heard it was a phenomenal season, which I still haven't watched. He did a movie in 2010 called Somewhere, which apparently is like a spiritual successor to this movie. I haven't watched it either. But... um. Yeah, I mean, this movie's always had a special place in my heart, and it is for some people loved. If you go on that YouTube, like, as you said, the movie's on YouTube. If you read the comments, some people really enjoy it, you know. And I'm I'm putting this review out there, discussion, sorry, out there for those who've always wanted to have a review out there or think it's worthy, and for those of you who don't know what the hell this movie is and are thinking, I'm not going to watch that actually. You know, it is what it is. <laughs> but I'm being completely selfish 
this is one of my personal favorite movies i think it has something to offer and i do think it does take some elements from woody allen because the director was basically told to do that and i think he did it and i, I don't think it's a bad movie i think uh, it's a shame I, I actually feel sad for this movie because i think there are lesser movies out there lesser romances that have had much bigger shine on them and maybe because the director had the bad dealings with his rep or whoever dealt with him in distribution it's a shame because i think the actors did a good job it's a fun movie if nothing else it's a snapshot of the 90s but hey at least it got a review from some podcast out on the internet somewhere and you know if you guys agree with me you know let us know (laughs) but james i really hope this wasn't i had a feeling to be honest with you you weren't going to be a fan of this movie because even i can see from a critical perspective a lot of things in this movie has been done better uh especially 20 years later that's without a doubt but i just wondered yeah, how bad in my mind i was thinking how bad is it really how far removed can i be from my bias to see to see what this movie is about and i was really glad i had you on here to just give your honest opinion because that's all that's all i want man just your honest opinion it was funny to to read the youtube comments because there are a lot of people who they, they would say, oh, I love this movie. And then there'd be like the people who are like, I hate Stella. You know, she's, <laughs> why, why Why didn't she, you know, this is all her fault. And then the person would be like, it's not her fault. You know, Jake did, did this. And uh, so they're passionate fans of this movie. And you're not one of them. <laughs> and I'm not one of them. But uh, it was... You know, again, if if I had seen this at a time where I had just gone through like a horrible breakup at nineteen, I might have a more favorable opinion of it. But it just at this point in my life, it just didn't speak to me the way that it it might have at that time. I really don't think it would. I honestly, I think now it won't hold up for a lot of people. This is I can freely admit it caught me at the right time. I have a lot of bias towards it. And it, it's not going to hold up as well because there's even a lot of movies that we're going to talk about down the line that is, you know, does a lot of these themes a lot stronger. But, you know, I don't want to keep going on and on about it. It has a special place in my iron heart. So, yeah, um, I would highly recommend, if anyone was a fan of this movie, you want to check out this interview that the director had with uh, this website where he illuminates on the making of the movie, his frustration on making the movie, and actually, the one thing I forgot to bring out is that Stephen Dorff wasn't even his first pick <laughs> for the main actor in this role. There was two other actors. Let me see. Yeah, Matthew Broderick. He was actually the first huh. pick. Yeah, I don't see this working with him at all. Hmm, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that. Matthew Broderick was the first pick. And uh, there was someone else. But again, check out. I'll just put the... I'll put the the link to the interview out there but it was cool man the, reading this interview was a missing piece of the puzzle for me with this movie uh it, yeah it's crazy it's crazy how much this movie's going for online but this is just one of them hollywood movies that just never got a release so it's some kind of collector's item in some people's eyes but in some people's it just it just wouldn't be so you know that is that oh do you know what i forgot to throw at you woody allen if woody allen had entropy in his hands james Uh, what would he have done we're going to keep the review going what would he have done james if woody allen had entropy what what do you think he would have done with this a completely different movie probably Uh, (laughs) it would have been i'm imagining it in black and white all Mm -hmm. of the the rapid uh cutting and the fast forward slow down stuff that would have been gone yeah i could see like if we're going to say it would have been 1999 he wouldn't have been working with mia farrow but i i see maybe not him in the lead maybe he would have gotten one of those actors who just tries to do the exact same performance that woody would have done you know even if it was stephen dorff it would have been stephen dorff trying to do a woody allen impression and uh it you know the it did remind me only in the the setup of stardust memories as far as like the filmmaker and the model and you know the sort of crazy relationship that they have yeah so woody could have absolutely done this kind of a movie it just stylistically would have been completely different he would have probably much more of a comedy (laughs) yeah no no youtube in it 
no you two and i just one thing i wouldn't have appreciated is you know i wish woody wouldn't insert himself as a neurotic main character because i think if he did it with a more serious tone you know i think i would have enjoyed that more just a just a straight character even you know deconstructing heavy yeah i, I just would have preferred the straight laced woody allen taking it serious even any hall he's not that he's neurotic to a certain extent but he, he just seems more balanced and i would have preferred he just take the angle with this jazz obviously would have been all over this as well mm-hmm. um so yeah but i still think the intimacy was there a lot of things were there man but woody allen would have probably made this movie into one of his best and i still think the movie has a good title i actually like the title of the movie if nothing else infamy what do you think no i i think that's probably um he would have kept the title i'm trying to remember the uh the original title for annie hall oh yes it did have an original title i forgot which I can't remember what it is now. I know it, it's the medical definition of not being able to feel joy. Jeez. But uh, I can't remember what what it's called. But um, yeah, I, I could see I could see it actually being structurally the same movie. It mm. just would have been tonally completely different. Hmm. I agree wholeheartedly. <laughs> <laughs> So yes, uh, that is that. Uh, guys, if you got any thoughts on the movie, share your thoughts with us down below. Again, you can find it on YouTube if you just can't find it in or anywhere else. You don't want to buy it on DVD. It's on YouTube. I'm not going to link it, but you, it's on YouTube. Entropy 1999. You'll find it in parts. I think it's in nine parts. A bit annoying, but what you going to do? Well, it says it's in, it says it's supposed to be in 11 parts, but the 11th part isn't there. Yikes. So, I think that's just the closing credits, though. Right, okay, well, something's better than nothing, right? <laughs> yeah. So, James, for our next movie, I want to take a sidestep. And actually, what I want to do, even though I said I get two movies, you get one, I actually want to pick a movie that I don't think either of us have seen, which I had a lot of requests to review this movie, and we're taking, we're stepping into a little bit of different territory. The next movie I want to discuss with you is actually a movie that was released on Netflix, Oscar-nominated, I'll give you a clue. One actor. Adam Driver. Marriage Story? Marriage Story. That is correct. And I I like the confusion in your voice. (laughs) Marriage Story? (laughs) (laughs) Have you seen it? Uh, I haven't. It has been on my list, but I haven't watched it yet. That is our next movie for discussion in February. And then you're up after that in March. So, yeah. Have you got any final words, uh, James? You know, I I would say that this is a movie that if you enjoy, like, if you really are into 90s movies, this is worth seeking out. You know, there's a lot of 90s fans out there. (laughs) I don't know if there's going to be like a 90s resurgence, because obviously right now we've got this love for the 80s right now. I don't know if that will ever happen to the 90s, but you never know. Maybe that will kind of push this movie to get a resurgence. I highly doubt it. I Mm. highly doubt it. I think... Only if Stephen Dorff's profile raised would this movie really be pushed forward to the forefront. Other than that, it's going to stay in that lost crack of cinema history, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, yeah, take James's word for it. But um, are you happy with my marriage story being the next one? It's a dra- drama, but... Yeah, I mean, it's like I said, it is a movie that's been on my list of things to watch. So uh, this gives me a reason to watch it. Before we get into that, I do want to say a lot of people say Kramer versus Kramer was like the inspiration for Marriage Story. So I'm probably going to watch Kramer versus Kramer, even though I saw Kramer versus Kramer a couple of years ago. Probably going to watch that again because I don't know. A lot of people say that Marriage Story is just aping off Kramer versus Kramer. So I'll probably watch that and we'll just have a little, well, I'll just throw that in there for a little compare and contrast. I don't know. Just I just thought I'll share that with the audience just in case. They want some extra background on how we're going to do this. So, uh, James, uh, where can the people reach you if they want to get in touch with you? Uh, well, they can always find me on manic-expression.com and my books are available on Amazon. Thank you, sir. The links to that will be in the description. I really felt like I took over on this one. <laughs> I, really, I kind of feel guilty. I just still talked about my favorite movie. James was swept along for the ride. 
I dragged him into the 90s against his will. But <laughs> hey, you know what? I that's where I'm from. So <laughs> <laughs> that's it. That's the spirit, James. Now we're gonna jump all the way back into modern times. Let's talk about a modern movie. Let's see what Scarlett Johansson and Adam Driver are saying. And guys, thanks for the recommendation. Don't forget to follow us on YouTube, subscribe to the feed. I'll put all the links down below. Thanks for listening. And uh, we, we do apologize if this review came out, this discussion came out a little bit later than usual, but we want this one out just before the end of January. So yeah, we're, we're grateful to you guys for checking us out and subscribing. We'll see you on the next recording, guys. Stay safe and uh, take care.